Welcome one and all to an all new episode of the Comic Multiverse, where the worlds of nerd meet. I, as always, am your host, Cape Joel, and joining me is Matt from the Fortress of Solitude. Hello, Joel. How are you going? Oh, I'm going all right. I'm trying to make sure I don't hiccup directly into the mic before we start this. <laughs> and failing at it, failing at it super hard. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I just kind of came right in the door and had to start the show. I was playing my first ever Pathfinder game for people who follow me on Instagram or Twitter, I'm sure they saw. And I knew it was going to be an issue because we got to the big dragon of the campaign at 8 o'clock and we normally record this show at 10 so I'm like, fuck, yeah, I'm going to be late for this one. I know it. <laughs> oh, it's Pathfinder. So it's, it's fun. Yeah, so that's why we're excused. <laughs> it's funny. I tweeted about it. Of course, you know, Pathfinder and D&D are like the Coke and Pepsi of tabletop role-playing games. So I had all the different fans being like, well, I like this about it. Well, I like this about the other one. So I, le I learned a lot tonight without even trying. I've only played Pathfinder once, and it wasn't really like a proper game either. We were just playing for fun sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, uh, the one thing I've really wanted to play is the, the Star Wars version of Dungeons oh, & Dragons yeah. they have called, um, I think it's called Edge of the Empire or something. I've seen it in like shops and everything, but and I've always wanted to buy it, but I don't have anyone to play with, like anyone who wants to play it. Uh, and I don't have enough people and everything. That would be fucking perfect for us, especially in time for the next movie. Tell you what, everyone, if you're out there and you have a copy of Edge of the Empire you're not using, send it to Matt or myself, and we'll totally play the <laughs> shit out of that. <laughs> it looks like a lot of fun. I imagine the problem in a game like that is that everyone would want to play a Jedi or a Sith. Ah, man, Smuggler. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would do, Smuggler or Bounty Hunter. They're the cool ones. Everyone wants to play a Jedi or a Sith. They're too obvious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, you know, troopers are our right true. There's some pretty good stories written about troopers. I mean, they don't all suck at shooting things. I mean, hey, look at Finn. That was a story <laughs> about a trooper, basically. He did all right. <laughs> yeah, he was all right. <laughs> that Rex, that's a cool archetype. He did okay. Wedge, <laughs> ev Wedge, even the dudes who just flew the planes around, they were fine. The space planes, you know yeah, the, the ones. Yeah, the pilots. <laughs> yeah, the pilots. You know, those guys who fly the planes. What are they called? Uh, space pilots. Yeah, yeah. yeah space planes. <laughs> you know, flyy, spacey guys. Them. Man, I'm so good at <laughs> writing science fiction, aren't I? <laughs> no worse than George Lucas. So, uh, yeah, Matt, believe it or not, there was actually a fair amount of news that dropped this week, and perhaps the biggest one, and the one we're going to talk about first, is something that I'm sure will be near and dear to your heart, especially as I look across at your Skype portfolio right now, and it's a picture of you in a Superman shirt. Superman is getting a new costume. Yeah, and um, it's a slight update on the one he's got at the moment, but... Boy, does it make a big difference. Yeah, I say new costume in giant finger quotes on here. Basically, it's the costume that he has now, only with a less emphasis on the whole, you know, scale mail thing. The red boots are back, and the red belt looks more like the classic red belt. Yeah, he's got, instead of, like, the one he's got at the moment is kind of like a diamond shape. This one's got, he's got, like, the, the, the House of L symbol as, as a belt buckle sort of thing in yellow, and... He doesn't have those stupid arm bracelet things anymore. Yeah, those are fun. Which I'm happy for. So basically, it's the classic Superman costume that we all know and love, minus the red trunks, is what it is now. Essentially, yeah. Essentially, which of course, if you had listened to the show in the previous uh, week when we had talked about it, Matt shared with us his amazing theory about the Superman we're dealing with right now in comics possibly being the blue electric Superman and that the new 52 Superman who died was red. And at the end of the next Superman story, Superman Reborn, I said what would happen if they fused together. I think that's what's going to happen, Matt. I think I think it is definitely going to happen because you you look at the Superman at the moment. His costume is mostly blue. Mm -hmm. He's just got all that's red is the red cape and the shield. That's basically it. And then you combine that with the new Fifty Two costume. He gets the red boots, a bit more red on the costume with the bell. It, it could happen. And they're already hinting and teasing that in the Superman Reborn story, Superman. Uh... New 52 will make some sort of reappearance. So, I mean, geez, wouldn't it be something if we called it right again? Oh, God, if we did, people have to start taking us a bit seriously. Yeah, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's like a crazy theory, but it's not a totally crazy theory. Because it, it's like, imagine if we did marry the New 52 Superman that a lot of new readers started with, with the classic Superman that everyone knows and loves. 
it's a crazy theory but then when you realize that like jeff johns is the one like sort of setting up everything for rebirth you're like no i could see him do that yeah and i think a lot of people would really enjoy it and i think it would be like yes this this is the superman who's here to stay now this is the superman for this generation yeah, and it'd it stop all those people whining about the new 52 Superman going and everything. It, he's technically back, but not. Yeah, he's he's fused into true Superman, Shin Superman. <laughs> the one and only. And uh, keeping up on this DC Rebirth bet, the other big piece of news that came out this week was also related to the bigger uh, plot lines going on in the Rebirth uh, era of DC. I was going to say, say event, but it's not an event, it's an era in publishing right now and that is they've announced a brand new batman flash crossover called the button yeah it looks like batman and flash are going to start investigating the button the comedian's button that batman found in the bat cave yep it's yep. so taking them a while taking them a while 20 i think this is running through like issues 20 and 21 of batman and flash mm -hmm. they took their sweet ass time getting to work on this didn't they yeah i think there's also another event with um Supergirl about the search for Saturn Girl as well. Yes, which I think is, that's happening as well. Yes, which they were sure to make reference to in the newer Justice League versus Suicide Squad story, and the whole thing with Saturn Girl and the Legion of Superheroes is a big hanging thread from uh, what you call it from uh, uh, from the Rebirth. first yeah from Universe Rebirth. So yeah, yeah. it's going to be a pretty damn interesting time in DC Comics right now. The shit's all lining up. It's all happening. Yeah, it's, it's looking to pay off in a big way, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's crazy to think. Did you ever think we would be here, Matt, especially if you listen to old episodes of the podcast, like during the DCU era, short-lived though it was, you and I were like, oh yeah, continuity over continuity, or continuity over creativity, geez, they just can't seem to get it right, can they? Yeah, it, it's really strange to think, and that was only like a couple of months before Rebirth, and um, it kind of makes sense now because you, you look at it and you think, oh, they, they probably knew Rebirth was coming, so they just didn't give a shit about this DCU thing anymore and everything just turned to shit. And, yeah, it, it's, it's a total change around of what's been happening. It is a perfect example of how in the comic industry how quickly fortunes can change. Oh, yeah, definitely. And it's funny, DC Rebirth is flying so high right now and Marvel is having a hard time finding their footing after uh, Civil War Two kind of dragged all the books down with it for a couple months yeah definitely and uh, yeah the the delays and everything didn't help it at mm. all now that's not to say marvel isn't putting out good books right now mighty thor is as good as it's ever been you know captain america this is one of the most interesting times to be reading that book you know you got the champions and all the new moved around avengers team but by and large though you know, when people are talking about what they're really loving and, you know, what's really crazy in comics right now, more often than not, it comes out to be DC Rebirth. Oh, yeah, totally. It's, it's the top of the sales charts and everything. I wonder, will Marvel, looking at what DC's doing, will they try and, you know, radically shake stuff up for themselves? Maybe. I don't know. Like, how could they even radically shape it up? I know a lot of people I know have said they had the perfect opportunity to shake stuff up at the end of Secret Wars and really go from scratch, but they chose not to do it. They chose to stay the course. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, here's an interesting theory and one that I've been kicking around. Uh, Isaac Perlmutter, we may have talked about this on the last episode, he may very well be leaving comics publishing soon to take up a career in politics. Apparently he's one of the people being eyed for Trump's cabinet so don't be shocked if there's a new powerhouse, new power player at Marvel Publishing in the future. Yeah, it I, it would definitely set a good precedent for because he's not very liked. No, uh, as far as I, I I've heard, and um, he's sort of the reason as well why like the movies and TV are kind of connected but not connected. Mm. So like, yeah, I could definitely see if he moves out, everything sort of changed like across the board in the comics and everything maybe they, they would have to restructure everything i mean he is a suit oh, yeah. he is a money man and no one likes suits or money man no no especially no. when all they care about is money not even not even other suits and other money men like suits and money man <laughs> so yeah i mean there's there's something to look forward to and uh from the dc side of things to the marvel side of things we turn our attention to netflix we got our first look this week, Matt, at the fully assembled cast of Netflix Defenders. 
Looking pretty good. Looking pretty good, all hanging out. I like it. It looks like an old band photo or something. They're hanging off the back of a truck as it drives. Yeah, yeah. And did you notice the number on the, tr- the truck? No, what did it say? 616. Ah, that's excellent. <laughs> I thought that was a nice little touch. That's really, really good. I guess we'll be getting Iron Fist before we know it, huh? Uh, yeah, like start of March, I think. Yeah, that's going to be good, man. Well, like mid-March, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a month and a half, two months away. Jesus, this, this Netflix universe hit us quick, didn't it, with all these series? It's strange to think because I remember when, you know, it was the week before Dare, the first season of Daredevil was coming out and we were all so excited and everything. Now we're, you know, two seasons of Daredevil in, a season of Jessica Jones, Luke Cage, we got a Punisher show coming, all this stuff happening. It's all happening and it's all happening on Netflix and fitting that, you know, it should drop the same day or the, around the same time as this image from the TV show. We got a brand new look at a, get this, Defenders comic book series that Marvel will be putting out with the exact same team from the TV show. I I wonder why that's happening. I know, right? (laughs) It's almost like they purposely try to make these things line up. Shockingly. Uh, Who's writing it? Bendis. Oh, oh. I know, that's either a really good thing or a really terrible thing, because with Bendis, it's like, man, those first two volumes are going to be great before he gets bored and moves on to other projects. (laughs) Yeah, before he remembers, he just made a new Iron Man and wants to go back and do that. (laughs) Two new Iron Mans with, you know, Riri and Doctor Doom, so fuck, he's going to be doing that, and he's going to be writing Defenders. This is also probably why he's leaving Guardians of the Galaxy as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely after keeping a death grip on that book for the longest time. I'm excited for this because, I mean, obviously everyone on the Defenders, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, Daredevil, Iron Fist, these are all characters that Bendis absolutely loves to death and in many cases has worked with very closely. Jessica Jones is his creation. He kind of, he gets the character very well, as he should because he fucking created her. And in fact, he seems to be the only creator who actually cared about putting her in stuff for the longest time. Uh, Daredevil... People forget this, especially in a day and age when we crap on Bendis for stuff like Civil War 2, which was very well deserved. He wrote one of the best runs of Daredevil of all time. Yeah, yeah, it was a really cool run. Mm. Easily one of the best, definitely one of my favorites. And, you know, he's gone out of his way to say, you know, I really want to challenge myself to write something different with Daredevil in this book than, you know, when I did when I had it before. Yep. So, I mean, you know, color me interested for this. I will definitely check it out. It's a good time for Marvel team books. All the teams are very, you know, eclectic and very interesting and very different from one another. Mm Mm-hmm. So I guess this is another one to put on the pile for that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Defenders. Yeah, I, I'm pretty excited for the comic. I, 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 I know you like gush about the the Iron Fist and Luke Cage book, and I, I read like the first couple of issues and I really liked it. And Daredevil has apparently been pretty okay. Jessica Jones has been pretty okay. So yeah, I'm I mean, pretty excited for it. It's a good time for them, you know. Marvel Street level, they're all they're all pretty strong looking at the moment. And uh, from the world of Marvel Comics and the world of Marvel Netflix to we're we're going back to the movies now, or at least we're going to the IMAX now. Uh, a call sheet leaked out just recently which everyone is already saying uh, has to be related to the Inhumans. It has to give us uh, a good understanding of who the Inhumans are going to be on TV. Now this call sheet that they got, uh, interestingly enough, it doesn't call the characters by name, but the first letters of all the names are representative of an Inhuman character. So instead of Black Bolt, you have Broderick who is described as a male, 30 to 40, Caucasian, can say volumes with just a look, wink, wink. Strong (laughs) and thoughtful, private though, and unaccustomed to being questioned. Then, you know, Major, female, 30 to 40, Caucasian, an elegant and intelligent advisor to her husband. Get it? Black Bolt, Mara, so... Or not Mara, freaking Medusa. I get them mixed up, because they're they're both redheaded, and they're both great female characters. Now, (laughs) that's a fight, is what that is. That's That's a crossover fight you need to have. And from there, you know, you get Maximus, who's the scheming brother, Karnak, Gorgon, Crystal, and Triton. So that looks to be the cast of the ABC show we now know. That's a pretty good cast. It's a pretty good cast. They definitely seem to get in the call sheet who these characters are supposed to be, so that fills me with a lot of, you know, hope for the series. 
Yeah, yeah, definitely. A call sheet is it's pretty good indication since since it needs to give the actors whoever plays the role some type of description on the character. So. Mm -hmm. I, I love we live in this day of nerd culture and everyone being on their A-game and everything. You can't hide these characters in a call sheet even by changing their name. Everybody already knows. Yeah, yeah, just like from the descriptions they give you, like, oh, well, that's obviously Maximus and that's obviously Black Bolt and everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it's another funny story about call sheets. Uh, this one actually relates to Star Wars, but it's one that always stuck out in my mind. Uh, Star Wars Rebels, when they got all those actors in for it, th they didn't even tell them it was for Star Wars. They had no idea what they were reading. Oh, wow, really? There's a great uh, interview on the Talking Tunes podcast with Rob Paulson where they get a bunch of those actors in, like Freddie Prinze Jr. and Steve Blum, and they talk about their experience auditioning for the show, and they're like, we had no idea it was Star Wars until we were cast for it. Oh, wow. That's, that's how serious they are about keeping Star Wars secret, and, and no one leaked that, but everyone got this ABC and humans thing. <laughs> I wonder what type of actors or what quality of actors they'll be going after for this ABC thing, because, you know, it's more than just a TV show now, it's an IMAX thing as well. Yeah, I, I imagine since it's kind of like a little mini event series, they probably go after actual movie actors, because they, they do that every now and then. You'll see, like, um, movie actors branch down into TV when they know it's going to be a big event series that a lot of people are going to see. Definitely. And, um... Even more so now because the first two episodes were also going to be in IMAX cinemas. Mm. So so it's technically a movie, but not yeah, a movie I mean, as well. If we have the call sheet, I think it's only a matter of time till we start hearing about casting, right? Oh, yeah. The, chances are they've probably even started filming. Yeah. Brian Cranston is Black Bolt. <laughs> yeah, I, I maybe see that. <laughs> a whole thing where Brian Cranston doesn't talk. <laughs> just but he's got that look though he, that that heisenberg stare he kind of does he kind of does I, I watched that movie he was in with james franco that came out over christmas why him oh yeah what was that like not good no nah. it's you can see why they dumped it at christmas time it's one of those lazy comedies where they'll have a joke and then another character will literally explain the joke and or just say it again Oh, <laughs> there's a kid in the movie. I swear he only exists to repeat what was going on. Like there's a bit where, you know, they go through a retina scanner and the kid goes, is that a retina scanner? Yeah, obviously we're not stupid. <laughs> and then there's a bit later where, you know, because James Franco's character plays like a Silicon Valley rich guy who makes apps and everything. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. I was really turned on to this charity by Melinda. And I'm like, oh, he's talking about Melinda Gates, of course. Like, Melinda Gates, that's Bill Gates. Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm not an idiot. If you have to explain who these people are to the pe uh, people in your audience, maybe you shouldn't be making these references if you think people are that stupid. Yeah, I like that type of com comedy when it's used ironically. Yeah, like like they do it in some movies. I'm I'm just trying to think of a um uh, a uh, one movie they do it in. They, there's like I think they do it in one of the um. Oh, I can't like remember it's usually what movie to it show that that character is a dumbass and doesn't get it. Yeah, yeah. Like, hey, look, it, it's this guy from this movie. Also, too, I know they do it all the time in Entourage. <laughs> uh, also, James Franco's house has like a Siri thing. It has like an artificial intelligence, and it's that oh. girl from The Big Bang Theory. Oh, really? Which they say, hey, it's that girl from The Big Bang Theory, and like the God joke, <laughs> and the joke is it's the voice of the woman from The Big Bang Theory. That's that is God. the joke. God damn it! <laughs> I'm like, really? This this movie thinks like the height of comedy is making reference to a TV show that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> God damn. Maybe it was written by them. <laughs> uh, no, that's the funny thing. Apparently it was a concept by Jonah Hill and like produced by Ben Stiller. I'm like, what the fuck? Really? Yeah, it was produced by funny people, which makes me think that's how they got Franco and how they got uh, Cranston to be in the movie. And then it gets even crazier because I read on IMDb, apparently like they shot 200 hours just of the actors improv -ing. Oh, so there, it's the that situation where they make a, 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 a simple popcorn comedy, but there is a, a way better movie in there somewhere. I guess, and I'm like, Christ, if this is the end result of 200 hours of improv, I would hate to read that script. Oh, yeah. 
But hey, comic books. So yeah, that was in humans. That was cool and everything. And uh, from the royal family of uh, the Marvel Universe to the royal families of the Game of Thrones universe, did you hear uh, Peter Dinklage is apparently being eyed for a role in Avengers very soon? Yeah, and I see a lot of people saying he's going to play this dwarf or this dwarf. Yeah, there's a fair amount. There's a fair amount in the Marvel Universe. I think he's just going to be a voice. Yeah, yeah, he's got a good voice for I could see him being like, you know, one uh, one of the aliens, like one of the elders of the universe or something. I saw someone suggest that he um he's going to be someone like the Living Tribunal or something. Oh, that would be fun. That yeah, I I could see the Living Tribunal speaking with uh, Peter Dinklage's voice. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Or, or maybe even hell, like the Watcher could show up. Oh shit! If they ever got the rights back with the Fantastic Four, mm, mm, that would be fun. That would be good. Yeah. Jeez, you, you, you're filling me with hope, Matt. You're filling me with so much hope. <laughs> hope is a dangerous thing, don't you know? It is. <laughs> I can only hope that if he is doing the voice of a character in something, he'll give more of a shit than he gave for being that little robot in Destiny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where he literally sounded like they shot him full of, like, sleep tranks before he had to go and record. <laughs> that wizard is from the moon. <laughs> he could not have given a fuck in Destiny. He really couldn't have. And, and the thing is, they replaced him as well. They did. With, uh, what's his name? The guy who voices everyone. Oh, Nolan North? Uh, uh no, the other one. Troy uh, Baker. Troy Baker, yeah. <laughs> you know it has to be one or the other. It's either Nolan North or Troy Baker at this point. Yeah. <laughs> Look, it's either Joker or it's Nathan Drake. Which one is it? <laughs> God, those those guys are great. They're great, and I love they're so self-aware that they know they're everyone in the damn world. Yeah. What, wasn't it at some video game award show they said, you know, people always ask us, how do we get into the video game voice industry? Uh, well, it's simple. You know, you study, you work hard, then you wait for one of us to die. <laughs> now, uh, from that to a piece of Spider-Man related news, we didn't talk about this last week, Matt. The new Scarlet Spider book from Peter David. Did we talk about that last week? No, we didn't. I think it came out just after we started talking about it. Right, because it kind of felt like we did. This, of course, is spinning out of the pages of the Clone Conspiracy. We now know Ben Riley is back, and he's being the Jackal. He's also apparently returning to the role that made him famous, the role of the Scarlet Spider. Um, all right. Yeah. Hey, cool. The, the book is being drawn by Ultimate Spider-Man's Mark Bagley. He's got a brand new costume on him and everything. It's... It's all right. I like he's actually wearing the hood now. It's funny. In his old Scarlet Spider days, he wore a hood, but or he had a hood. He had, like, the sleeveless hoodie, but he never actually wore it on his head. Right, right. I know a lot of people have pointed out going, like, geez, he's got a hood on his head now. Spider-Gwen has a hood on his head now. Is he ripping off Spider-Gwen? <laughs> <laughs> Is that him trying to be young and youthful now and be like, oh, that's a good look. I'm going to do that. <laughs> You can't stop me, I'm Ben Riley, I'm the Scarlet Spider. I don't really know if we need any more spider people. I was talking about this last week, because we have so many now. Silk, Spider-Gwen, Peter, Spider-Man 2099, Miles. That's a yeah, lot of Yeah, yeah, we, we got lots, and they all have pretty much their own books. Yeah, that's they do, and that's not even counting like the Web Warriors who existed for the bit uh, for a little bit there. My question going in is like, what can the Scarlet Spider Ben Riley do that all these other Spider characters couldn't in their own book? Uh, he can wear a hood. Oh wait, <laughs> <laughs> damn it! He can't even do that now. He can he can do his taxes real well. <laughs> That'll be the book. Just a bunch of clerical. <laughs> Just a bunch of clear. It's it's funny. At this point, I would have actually much preferred if he stayed in the guise of the Jackal. Because if you've seen that like red, red suit with like the Anubis head and everything, that's a good look, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, kinda. Wouldn't wouldn't it be something if the book would, instead of like you know the new Scarlet Spider was the Amazing Jackal? Wouldn't that be an interesting read? Because yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Because apparently he is like a CEO now and everything of his own company. And the solicitation I read said he needs to find a way to, like, make peace between his life as the Jackal and his life as the Scarlet Spider. And I'm like, well, how the hell is that going to happen? <laughs> also, wait to spoil the end of Clone Conspiracy, too. I guess he survives. Yeah, well, what if it, What if the clone of Ben Riley is a clone? The clone of a clone is a clone? 
yeah, I can yep. see them doing that. Also, yep. also, when a bunch of people ask, because apparently a lot of the younger fans who grew up with that uh, short-lived but very cult uh, Kane Scarlet Spider series is like, hey, why isn't it Kane? Why can't Kane come back and be the guy? And you know, only for Peter David to say, oh, well, Kane is actually going to be in the book. He's going to feature quite prominently in it. I'm like, oh, so you're going to have two Scarlet Spiders in the same book now is what you're saying. <laughs> Jesus Christ, that's a lot to take in, isn't it? It is. And once again, Marvel, who is getting really bad at this, spoils the end of the story by going like, yeah, he's totally alive at the end. Oh, God damn it! <laughs> they both live, and I'm like, well, shit, why should I keep reading Clone Conspiracy now that you've told me all the main players will live? Yeah. They're too, they're too, they bring in too much money for them to kill off. I guess. Is it one of these things, too, is Marvel so worried people won't pick up their next story these days? That's why they try super hard to let you know what's going to happen months in advance? I can't remember the last Marvel twist that genuinely surprised me. I guess so. Well, the thing is, like, if, if they don't spoil it, that guy from Bleeding Cool will. <laughs> oh, Rich Johnson, yeah. Actually, you know what? I take it back. There was something. The one book that genuinely shocks me, Captain America. That's the last book that genuinely shocks me, which is probably why I like it so much, because they're not going out of their way to spoil Nick Spencer's story. Yeah, I should really catch up on that. I, I read, like, the first little bit of the arc, and up until, like, we found out that Cap kind of isn't Hydra, but kind of is... They, they that do, kind of weird thing. They do a lot of interesting stuff. In fact, I'll talk about the newest issue uh, when we get into what we read this week. I think you'll really get a kick out of it. Cool. Uh, another piece of news, uh, the Flash Supergirl crossover that's going to be happening will be a musical, and they've announced who the villain for this one is going to be. Yeah, Music Maestro. Freaking Music Maestro, who uh, you may remember from the Superman Brave and the Bold cartoon voiced by Neil Patrick Harris. Yeah, and a lot of people seem to expect them to get him back for this role. I, I don't, don't know how or why. <laughs> I don't think they will, but how awesome would it be if they did? It would be pretty awesome. I'm intrigued by this whole episode in, anyway, because it, it sounds so fun and it so does. different from what they do. It's the absolute opposite of everything that's going on in the DC movies right now. Yeah, yeah, it's like, you'd never see that in the movie. Oh, Supergirl and Flash are going to fight Music Maestro in a musical-centric episode. Mm -hmm. What the fuck? <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's my pitch, Matt. This is exactly what's going to happen. Uh, Meister is going to zap Supergirl and Flash with, like, a song ray that makes it so they can only sing their lines, <laughs> so they all need to work together with their respective teams to defeat Meister so they can reverse what he did to them. Also, it'll be like those episodes of, like, Buffy, and just yes. recently, It's Always Sunny. Yes. <laughs> God, yes. Man, I can't, wait for, I can't wait for this. I hope they have, like, some real showstoppers. I hope they have, like, you know, the fun palling around song. I hope they have, like, the, like, Supergirl gets to sing a ballad, and then you get the villain song from the music maestro as he sings about how evil he is. <laughs> You know, you got, you got to get really Jesus Christ superstar with it. You know, you just need to rock the fuck out with it. <laughs> I've actually been going back for another project. I've actually been watching a bunch of musicals again. I watched uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, the original 70s version. I watched the uh, updated remake of Little Shop of Horrors. That's what I've been going around doing. Oh, nice. There's a lot of, there's a lot of good shit in there. I've been singing a song in my heart. And uh, from that piece of DC TV news to another piece of DC news, and this, this one's a little less gray, this one's a little less fun, this is more of a little head smacking. <laughs> so remember we talked a little bit about that Powerless show in the previous episode, how it had been reworked to try and tie in deeper to the like greater DC continuity? Yep. <laughs> well, now we learn something new. Alan Tudyk, who we of course all love from Firefly and his many other roles, and even just recently in Rogue One as everyone's favorite new droid. Well, apparently his character in the show they've come out and said will be Bruce Wayne's cousin. Yes, Van Wayne, who, that, who calls Bruce B dubs. <laughs> that's fucking dumb. I'm gonna say that right now. <laughs> <laughs> is not the whole point of Bruce Wayne that he really has no family he can rely on? Because if he did, why would he become such a weirdo who dresses up in leather and beats up crazy people? Exactly. And I've, I've actually seen people like tweet at, the, tweet at the actual Powers account saying, like, if 
Bruce Wayne had family. Why did he not go live with them when he became an orphan? Exactly. At thus, least, thus making Batman not even a thing. <laughs> at least with, you know, like, Batwoman, who is his actual cousin in the comics, and, you know, her father, Jake Kane and everything, at least they make a point of being like, yeah, well, their families were really estranged and everything, and that was his uncle on his mother's side, who really didn't like the Wayne family and everything, so there was tension there. What cousin is he now, Alan Tudyk, going to play, and how far removed is he, and how are they going to well, explain that? Well, that's the thing. They can't be that far removed if he's just calling up Bruce and calling him nicknames and everything. That's also like really- that's that's not that's not something like some random cousin you met like once ten years mm-hmm. ago says. Mm-hmm. That's also going to be really dumb. I don't want to watch the show and be like, "Hey, Bruce. Hey, buddy," on the phone, but never actually see him. Because why would you ever actually see him? Yeah, you just hear that he's talking to Bruce Wayne, but yeah, you never hear who who's playing him or anything. Because you could never do that on TV, because you know that would just confuse too many people. Wait, is this the oh, same? Yeah. <laughs> is this the same Bruce as in Gotham? Is this the same Bruce as in you know uh, what is it? The other shows? Just, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I like to think that he's calling up Affleck's Bruce Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> So he's all mo- mopey and everything in Gotham. He's drinking, snorting cocaine and shit, and he just gets a call up from Ad- Alan Tudyk. <laughs> Can't talk, hitting tire. <laughs> now that being said, if they wanted to take the piss out of the movies even more so, and like you said, Matt, make it so he is talking to the movie version and be like, "Ah, you moping today? Ah, I guess he can't talk then. Bye." <laughs> That'd be really, actually really great, but I kind of think that's not what's going to happen. No, it's hard to believe the ballsiest, most you know, subversive thing in the DC canon right now of films to TV shows might actually be the Lego Movie for not being afraid to take the piss out of what's going on in the movies. Yep, yep. I can't believe I'm excited for Lego Batman. If you told me, like, like two months ago you'll be excited for Lego Batman, I'd be like, fuck off. Yeah, I know. It's, it's going to be a better Batman than what we've got at the moment. Maybe maybe that's the Bruce Wayne Alan Tudyk is talking to, the Bruce Wayne from Lego <laughs> Batman. <laughs> Will Arnett. Dude, Will Arnett does TV. He could fucking show up as the Bruce Wayne of this universe just to really confuse you. Wait, aren't you usually Lego? Yes, I'm normally Lego, but I'm human now. <laughs> oh, that guy, he just, he just, Will Arnett just sees the world in Lego, that's why. <laughs> yeah, he, too many hits to the head. Yes, he just sees the world in yellow bricks. Now, there we go, Matt. We wrote it. We did it. We did it. We, we it, cracked it. Powerless best show ever now, thanks to us. You're welcome. Yeah, if, if if that's going to be the mid-season um, finale. finale, then, uh, yeah, you can thank us later. Send us a check. And it's got to be a comedy thing, too. It's like, oh, no, my cousin Bruce is coming to stay for the weekend. What do I do? <laughs> whoop a doo everybody you know we gotta we gotta clean up and you gotta make bruce think i'm a rich guy too even though i'm not a rich guy <laughs> god it also opens up another door it's like okay so if he's bruce wayne's cousin does that mean batwoman exists in this universe too she would technically be his cousin as well could we well, see that's her? the thing that's the thing like what we've seen on it that this universe is only populated by c and d list superheroes and villains <laughs> so no no probably not. The, the 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 hero quote unquote that they've got for the tv show is like some really obscure dc hero from like the 80s or something oh of course nice i i don't i can't even remember her name but yeah I- it's it's someone it's not someone you see in like comics these days I make fun, but truth is, Powerless might actually be pretty refreshing because it stars a lot of people we like. It does, but and that, but what I've seen so far is that it looks really bad. I, I was saying to myself, hey, you know what? The American version of the IT crowd starred people you liked, and it still fucking sucked. Yeah. Look at that, everyone, if you're bored. Go check out the American version of the IT crowd if you want to kill some brain cells. <laughs> don't. Yeah, and I'm, not even, and I'm not even one of those people who are like, oh, American versions of TV shows ruin the subtlety. But no, really, it ruined the subtlety, and it was it was the worst. Yeah, it was the worst. You compare that to, like, the, the American version of The Office. The American version of The Office is great. Yeah, yeah, it actually does it pretty good. Goes on for longer, but pretty good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and uh, talking about going on longer, we're going on longer, too, because it's time. It's that time of the week. It's time to talk about what we read this week. And I read a shitload of stuff and i'm still not even done this was this was a nuts week 
I, I know I'm still go. I've still got at least five or six books to go, and I, I I've already done over ten. I'm so tired, Matt. I'm so tired. Please <laughs> help me. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. <laughs> who would Who would like to go first? Would you like to go first? Uh, I think I went first last week. Did you? Okay, I'll go first this week. And you know, well, you know, because I buried the lead on it and everything. I'll talk to you about Captain America number nine. This is this is the big trial of Maria Hill issue. She's finally going up on military tribunal for all the evil shit she did during standoff in Pleasant Hill. And you think like, Jesus. Oh, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, the, the wheels of justice move mighty slow, Matt. <laughs> It takes time to bring her up on this. Also, I love she was just doing her job in other books, too, even though she was indicted <laughs> for horrible crimes against, you know, like, horrible Geneva Convention violations. She was still just, you know, punching the clock nine to five. <laughs> that must have been pretty awkward at the coffee machine. Hey, Maria, how you doing? Ah, military tribunal. Yeah, yeah, I've uh, been bringing up on trumped up charges. Uh, trumped up charges. No, I, I totally didn't create a super villain Abu Grave where I tortured people's minds. No, I totally didn't do that. <laughs> I did <Yeah>. that. <laughs> well, that's the funny thing. She's not denying anything in this issue. She's like, yep, I did it. I'll do it again. I'm not going to say I'm sorry. Yeah. Like her. That is, she is totally the Marvel Universe's answer to Amanda Waller. This just like, you know, morally dubious, morally gray, like, hey, I did it for a reason. You need monsters like me to protect you from the other monsters. But but her big Hail Mary play during this whole thing is she's like, okay, you won't indict me if I give you a great invention that only S.H.I.E.L.D. can give to the world. And what she essentially does is she throws all her scientists at creating an energy shield powerful enough to encompass the whole Earth and protect it from a Chitauri invasion, which we know now is actually being masterminded by Captain America to keep the superhero community busy. <laughs> you would have thought like like a planetary shield would be like one of the first things they do once they find out there's like superhumans mm. and evil space aliens. You, you, you'd think that would be like the first thing on the list. You would think so, and the irony is not lost on me or anyone else in the room that literally... Maria Hill's plans for fighting evil aliens is I will build a wall around the earth and keep all of the evil baddies out. <laughs> That's all literally the space her Mexicans. Plot. That's literally her plot. She's like, and I will make the Chitari pay for it. You don't think they have money because they don't wear pants, but they do. <laughs> and and the whole like military tribunal is like, this is stupid. You're obviously trying to get out of this. We're going to throw the book at you. And she's like, yeah, of course you would say that. You know, all the more third world countries who want uh, trade with aliens and everything, but all the Americans and everything, of course, the Americans and the Brits and all the major world powers, they're not going to say no to this. And so I'm going to walk scot free. And she does. <laughs> And so now we got the whole wall thing going on. But yeah, that was the that was the trial of Maria Hill, and I thought it was a great moment of her just being an evil bitch. Yeah, yeah. But also, it, it's more than just a shield, too. It's a shield, but it also interferes with, like, teleporters and everything else on Earth. So pretty much the way she's doing it is if anyone wants to come to Earth, they have to go through shield. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's... Uh, uh, so she, yeah, I'm going to build a wall. <laughs> I, she will build a wall. I like that. I'm like, man, in a story with Nazi Captain America, Nazi sleeper agent Captain America, it can still get crazier. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell is he going to do for an encore at this point? <laughs> and now I will eat chainsaws while juggling them. <laughs> but yeah, that was that was Captain America. What uh, what did you have this week, Matt? I had Justice League Power Rangers issue one. Oh, fuck yeah. Let's talk about this. Oh, God. How awesome was it? Oh, my God, I love it so much. I just want to rub it all over myself. It's funny, they really spend the first issue here explaining the particulars of how a Power Rangers Justice League crossover could realistically happen. And Tom Taylor, who we love on this show, chooses probably the smartest way I could imagine, and that is, oh, yeah, well, it was a teleporter malfunction. Yeah, yeah, I said, like, it's it's kind of cliched, but it's it's fine because of the... If fucking Power Rangers shit like that would always happen on that kind of show. It would. And, and um, people forget, like, the Rangers teleporter is, like, one of the most powerful teleporters in fiction. It can teleport you to other planets. It can teleport you all over the place, but they never use it for more than just to get them downtown. 
Yeah, yeah. So to see them sort of use it as this sort of plot device that transports the Rangers over to the DC Prime universe. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's pretty pretty cool. Pretty cool. And the Rangers... Kind of short first issue, though. It really it was. Short. It really was. It was a lot of getting to know you stuff. The Rangers beat Batman. Let's just say that. Yeah, Batman has to call in the Flash. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love it. Batman is manhandling Zack, who is ironically the POV character for this. I think it's interesting yeah. that we A, spend more time with the Rangers this issue, and B, they let Zack be, you know, uh, our audience avatar. I guess he never got to do much in the show, so here we go. Here's a good thing for him. Yeah, they probably just wanted him to do something. <laughs> for a change, yeah. I like Batman's beating on Zack, and then the five other Rangers coming in, boom, it's six on one. <laughs> Yeah, and then and then Batman realizes he's outgunned. That's fine. I got friends too. I'll call my friends to come and help me. They've got colorful costumes too. <laughs> it's it, they even do a take on the whole like classic. Oh, hey, you're not from this universe. You're not from my universe. Let's fight. But it makes sense for these two guys because literally all they do is fight weirdos in costumes. So of course they would think the other one is evil. Yeah, they would think they're Rita's henchmen or mm-hmm. Lord Zed's henchmen or something. Yep. Yeah, I, I like too. This comic pulls no punches because when you dig into the first page, Angel Grove is already destroyed. Yeah, over three hundred thousand people are dead and everything. <laughs> and Superman <laughs> comes floating down. He's like, "I'm sorry, I'm so sorry." But then they cut him off because it's like, "Wait, is he sorry because he couldn't save them, or is he sorry because he did that?" <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty interesting. I didn't think about it like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I like it. So like, oh yeah, they're pulling no punches. They're setting it right up for you. This is this is what's happening. Yeah, but yeah, it's a fun time. If people are wondering, hey Jill, you didn't do a review for Justice League Power Rangers on your channel. Yeah, because that's over on the DC Fan Channel. Actually, you can check that out there if you're so interested. Yeah. So yeah, that's that one. That one's definitely a pickup. That's just a fun, good time, is what that book is. Yeah. Uh, what else did I have this week? Uh, oh, Justice League v. Suicide Squad, number four. Yeah, another big issue. Yeah, wow, they are cramming so much into single issues of this mini, it's insane. I actually really like the way they're doing that. They're using this to tell the full story while the backups of Justice League and Suicide Squad are, are telling, like, past stories of the people involved. So, like, we've got a, a Maxwell Lord Rebirth issue mm-hmm. for, the, the recent Suicide Squad book, which we'll talk about, uh, also talked about the, the original Suicide Squad, Suicide Zero. Yeah. And stuff like that. So, yeah, I really like what they've been doing with, like, just having this Justice League versus Suicide Squad book be just about the pure story, not saying, oh, you need to read all this stuff before you read this book and everything. It's very well handled. Very well handled. Yeah, especially for a guy who has only really written The Flash. <laughs> Yeah, well, he wrote a bunch of indie shit beforehand, but yeah, this is his first, like, big company thing. First big company crossover. Yeah, yeah, and it's great. It's so great. He really does find the little moments I love. I love that, you know, uh, Harley and Wonder Woman team up again and remember, hey, weren't we friends in Little Black Book? Yeah, yeah, you were, actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I like that, uh, like, the, the, what is it, uh, Enchantress and Baz get taken out of the fight really early because they're too powerful, but then they come back in. They even drop hints at Saturn Girl and everything from the future. Yeah, and that, that kind of makes me question, like, I wonder if, like, maybe this team is trying to do something good, but they've just been manhandled by, obviously, Waller and Lord. Uh, Maxwell Lord now and everything. So, yeah, it makes me think, like, Emerald Empress, uh, a- anyway, is it, probably kind of a good guy well, she she's was trying a, to help satin girl and everything well she was a legion villains but yeah still yeah the batman and deadshot and waller team up to fight lobo who was arguably believed the strongest most powerful one on that team yeah i i had people tell me that like i should i should be concerned with batman killing lobo and i'm like Lobo's not dead. Yeah, he's a mortal. He can't die. <laughs> he, he has Deadpool level healing factors. Plus, have you not seen the solicitations? He's gonna be <laughs> on the new Justice League of America team. He's fine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's literally fine. Batman knew that wasn't gonna kill him, but he knew the only way to break the mind control was for him to literally break Lobo's head so he couldn't kill them all. Yeah, yeah. It's that actually really very cool. clever on Batman's part to be like, okay, I can actually cut loose with you. Yeah, and we also find out what 
Maxwell Ward is after. The Eclipso Diamond. Yeah, the Heart of Darkness. Something I didn't expect to see. Well, it, it's actually kind of fitting because in the very short-lived and admittedly very shit Team 7 book from uh, The New 52, Waller and Deathstroke and all of them were on a team together, and that's what they were getting. They were getting the Eclipso Stone. Ah, I never read that book, so... Uh, no one read that one. I had to look that <laughs> I had to look that piece of information up, and I'm like, oh, that's solid that they remember that she had that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I like that. And once again, they flip the script four issues in. It's like, oh, it was Justice League versus Suicide Squad, and the League were the good guys, and Suicide Squad was the bad guys. Oh, wait, now the League is mind-controlled, and now only the squad can save the day. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I'm interested to see what they're going to do with that, especially now that uh, I like, uh, like Maxwell says, like he doesn't need that team anymore, need the Suicide Squad team, especially now that he has the most powerful beings in the world under his control. Yeah, they, they do a lot in a very short amount of time. It's amazing what they manage to get done. Yeah, how, how long is the, the actual series go two, for? Two more issues. Oh, wow, really? Yeah, it's going to be done in two weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah, n not only is this one gone fast, not only have they jammed a bunch of content into each issue, but they all came out on time, and it's going to be over soon. Yeah, that, I think that's probably what's throwing me off. Like, it comes out weekly, and it's kind of throwing me off, and I'm not getting any news about, like, oh, issue six is going to be delayed two weeks or something. It's a nice feeling, isn't it, to actually be able to read comics on time? Is it so much to the point I'm willing to forgive that some of the art in places is rushed? Yeah, well, did they have a different artist this issue than last one? Uh, I think it's the same guy. I know some of the faces looked weird and distended. I assume that was just yeah. someone rushing, but I could be wrong. Yeah, maybe. So yeah, that was uh, that was Justice League Suicide Squad. It continues to be a really pleasant and really surprising event from an event that I had totally written off as being shit because I'm like, oh god, another versus? This can't possibly be good. Yeah, well, yeah the thing is they, they've been sort of doing twists and turns we never really expected first we thought it was the new suicide squad they're gonna fight then we realized it's the old one now it's reversed and the suicide squad are the good guys and yeah they're doing some pretty cool stuff in those books a lot of really clever ideas back to back i take my hat off to that one for continually for continually keeping you guessing yeah yeah uh what else did you have this week matt uh we're just staying on that i had suicide squad issue nine Oh, yes, this is the Origins of Suicide Squad Zero. Yeah, and it was a lot better than the, the issue before it, which was a tie-in as well, which w actually wasn't a tie-in. It's, um, it's funny, I picked this one up. I, I enjoyed it, but I still thought it was kind of weak. I don't know what it is about Rob Willemson or whatever there. I don't think he really has a handle on the squad for whatever reason. Yeah, uh, I can I can see that. I haven't read most of his stuff in, like, the, the, uh, the Black Vault and whatever that is. Um... But uh, this one, it was all right. We we got to see that that squad on their first and last mission. Yeah, uh, which was pretty cool, fighting the Jang Sung gods. Yeah, which uh, which so, I, I I like Jang Sung there. It's like, hey, it's not China, it's not North Korea, it's a vaguely evil Asian nation that doesn't offend anybody. <laughs> yeah, it's just somewhere near Asia. <laughs> yeah, but where in Asia? Asia. Asia's a big place. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's near there. <laughs> <laughs> it's near there. It's all near there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. I liked that it showed like Walla w was able to use these these people's hearts, desires, their greed, and everything mm -hmm. against them, and everything shows like why Walla is is as good as she is. Mm -hmm. Why she at what she does has a backup plan. Yeah, yeah, I thought that was pretty cool and. Really, it didn't really give us a lot to go on with the actual no. Ju Justice League Suicide Squad story. It was more of like a setup to put them in that prison that they got broken out of. Yeah, and even the information they give you to be like, oh, well, you know, Rustan was a loyal soldier, and, you know, the other guys were a little bit more evil and rowdy, but Lobo will do anything for money. That's information you glean from the main story anyway. I would say this was probably the most unnecessary of the two tie-ins. Yeah, totally. And and the the thing I found really weird was that inclusion of that uh that guy Cyclotron. Yeah. I think he was only there just to so there'd be an explosion. That's exactly why. And and the team would be knocked out. Because I, I can't see any other reason why he would be there. And, and to kill someone on a suicide squad mission because that's tradition. You got to kill at least one person. And literally, when all the characters were lining up, I'm like, oh, you're the red shirt. Yeah, you literally have red on your shirt. No one knows who you are. You're gonna die. You are the fucker who's not making it back. 
<laughs> and indeed he didn't. I, I mean, I guess we'll talk briefly about the Justice League one uh, as far as tie-ins go. Again, I had no intention to read this because I wasn't reading Justice League. Pleasantly surprised by what my boy Tim Seeley did here with this book. There was a Justice League one this week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't read the Justice League tie-in? I was sure that was last week. No, 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 this week. Because there's one coming out this week. Oh, coming. I guess they got two then. But yeah, this one was the origin story of Maxwell Lord. But yeah, yeah, that was last week. Was it last week? Yeah, well, yeah. I, but I read it this week. <laughs> you obviously read it a week late. Yeah. Well, fuck me then. then we won't it's talk still a pretty it. good book, though. It was. It was really solid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fuck me, it was pretty good then. <laughs> but uh, I guess from one versus series to another, we can hop over to Marvel then and talk in humans versus X Men number two. Are you reading this map? I am. I am. Got a little better this week. It did. I, I've been enjoying the, the series all up, but um, I think that's mainly because I'm an Inhumans supporter. And this was whereas a, a lot of the people books. commenting on my videos aren't Inhumans supporters. No, no, they're not. I will say this about the series: it's doing a much better job having fans have actual like important like, discussions and debates on the merits of teams and what's right and what's wrong way more than Civil War Two did. Oh, yeah, it's doing a much better job than it did in that. <laughs> because depending on who has, like, uh, who has the reins of an it, the issue, like, the last one was all about the X-Men. They had the reins and they really painted the Inhumans as villains. This issue, the Inhumans had the reins and they did a pretty good job painting the X-Men as villains. Yeah, and they're doing that as well with, like, the tie-ins as well, where so we'd get an X-Men tie-in that shows the Inhumans as bad guys, and then I think this week starts the Inhumans tie-in, so I imagine we'll see the X-Men as bad guys as well. They're doing a really good job of making neither team the better one. Yeah. They're on. Pretty, they're both. They're both pretty evil. They're, they're both on pretty equal footing, which I appreciate. I, I even like uh, Medusa's. Like, no, 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 no. They're the X Men. They're heroes. I can talk to them only for the Human Torch. Like, they brought Magneto and Sabretooth with them. At known killers and criminals. You think they're here to talk? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and then there's the complete opposite with Storm, saying she's going to attack the the Royal Inhuman family, not to hurt anyone else, painting them as as. As heroes and and the royal human family as villains. Well, even then, storms like you know, oh, we're invading a place. We're rounding up innocent people. They're hating us and throwing shit at us. Oh man, I think we're the bad guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm surprised as well. This issue, we didn't actually get to see any of Emma Frost, the the no. woman who caused all this. No, and the one who will ultimately be revealed to be the true villain. Mark my words. Oh yeah, definitely. She Everything she's been saying is like something a villain would say. <laughs> she is fanning the flames of hatred, and furthermore to that, in the post-Inhuman, post-X-Men books, which we've gotten all the solicitations for, she's not in it. Yeah, which yeah. Which means she probably gets ousted, exiled, maybe even killed, who knows. There's a book, Exiled. <laughs> Ooh, Exiled, yeah, I like that. The Exiled Emma Frost. <laughs> she is a cool and interesting character, and again, I like her when she's being, you know, uh, what is it, morally gray. Because, you know, she yeah. she's always had been, like, you know, oh, I'll be on the cabal, because why not? Yeah, yeah, she and she's, she's very manipulative. She is. Even even when she's on the side of the angel, she's still not very nice. She she no. is an ice queen, quite literally. <laughs> it's in her freaking name. So yeah, in Human vs. X-Men... It, bu it bugged me because it just existed, like, so shortly after Civil War II. I'm like, oh, God, I don't want another book where heroes fight each other. But it's actually gotten pretty good and pretty interesting. Which I, yeah, it's, which, it's pretty Which cool. I attribute entirely to Charles Soule just being a good writer. Oh, yeah, totally. And being able totally. to suck you in and everything. And uh, speaking of good writers, a book I know you and I both read this week, Action Comics. Oh, the... I don't think this... This wasn't the ending of the, the Men of Steel storyline i think there's one more issue i'm not too sure yeah the penultimate yeah yeah the, this issue was great it was i like uh i like that lex luthor has narration duty on this one yeah it's a really great narration on it on his part and everything and the the story is even better like when we see superman try is is kind of forced to try and kill lex luthor but he won't because you never judge a man by crimes he might do mm -hmm. in a possible future you trust you do what he's doing now you know i thought that was really cool and really superman like yeah b both men kind of grow and change this issue because lex 
tells this new Superman how much he actually cared and was inspired to change his life by the actions of the old Superman, and this new Superman actually kind of listens to him, and it's a really nice moment. Yeah, yeah, I'm still convinced he's got something shady planned, um, but it's, for the most part, he's, he's, he's a good guy, yeah. I guess. And even by the end of this issue, they kind of reverse fortunes, where now, because they're trapped on a planet with a red sun, Lex has to defend Superman. Yeah, yeah, I, I thought that was that was pretty cool. But also, that I hope they do show that this Superman can actually look after himself without powers, because mm. he can. He, he's, he's had, like, fight training and stuff from Batman and all these other people, so that, yeah. That would be a nice story to tell. Hell, they did a whole episode of Justice League action that was just that. Yeah, exactly. That was a great episode. Yeah, and and at, at the end of this issue, that other Clark found Lois and John. Yeah, and we don't really know. Is he a good guy? Is he a bad guy? What's his deal? I'm still convinced he might be Superboy Prime. That would be some shit, wouldn't it? Some type of bad guy sort of thing. I I I read this one and then I read Justice League versus Suicide Squad and like it, it's just my mind putting it together. But he he in that comic says well well well, and then Maxwell Lord says the exact same thing the first time we see him huh. in thing. It, it, it's it's absolutely nothing. But my mind's like, what if he's being controlled? Mm. What if this? What if he's being controlled or something? Like it, it definitely isn't going to happen. But oh. Imagine. That, would, that would be some crazy far-reaching implications is what that would be. Yep. Uh, what else did you have this week, Matt? Um, oh, I had action comics. I had All-Star Batman issue six. Yes, the return of Mr. Freeze. I'm so happy he's back. He's one of my favorite Batman villains. Me too. To think he was so inactive for like four years. Yeah, we hardly saw him through the new 52 and everything, and I'm, I'm hoping that this, like him coming back in this and with Scott Snyder writing him, makes other writers say, hey, I want to use Victor Freeze again. I want to use him in another storyline or something. Yeah, I think that would be really cool. It was worse than not inactive. He was inactive and he had totally lost his edge, which ironically was due in part because of Snyder, because they did that annual with him that, where they yeah. retconned his origin and said, oh, well, he was just a crazy guy. His wife was never actually his wife. And it's like, oh. And this is Snyder kind of going back and fixing that and being like, well, I'm not saying he's not his wife, but he does care about her. And, you know, he is trying to build a frozen utopia just for him and her. Yeah, it, it was really cool book. I really like that they do that. They kind of make him a villain, but he's a sympathetic villain. Yeah, he's a he, He's one you can feel sorry for and everything. Man, Jock's art. How about that? It's nice, but um, as some people point out, and I have to agree with them, it can get confusing at points. Mm. Like some points, and and the, the I think the way they also scripted this comic, how it was all, it wasn't in speech bubbles or anything. No, it was all in like um text boxes and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But but it was it looked really great. It, it looked remind, great. It reminded me a lot of Thirty Days of Night because you literally had yeah. ice zombies. You had Batman versus White Walkers. Yeah, that was really cool. <laughs> pun in, pun most definitely not intended. It was hard for me to talk about that book without accidentally making ice puns. <laughs> Man, this new Mister Free story was really cool, and his design is positively chilling because he doesn't need his suit in the Arctic. He just walks around naked. <laughs> That is a really great idea, though. I'm surprised Mr. Freeze has never done to try and kill Batman, and that is just take him out to the Arctic without a coat and being like, look, I'll be fine. I thrive in sub-zero conditions. You don't. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually surprised they haven't done something like that. Well, I guess, like, Batman, like, in this story, would kind of know that would happen and put some heat virus in his in his body or something. Hot death. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really, again, that's something Jock does, writing like horrible physical deformments and everything and having Batman get all tumory and gross. Yeah, it looked really cool. <laughs> it was really cool. Man, I don't even know how they're going to follow that up, too, because it ends with Batman and Mr. Freeze locking themselves in like a cryo tube, and it's like, and then what the fuck happens? Yeah, they wake up in the 31st century. <laughs> God damn, with Terry McGinnis. It's a, it's a crossover with Batman Beyond. <laughs> Which I'd be like, fuck me, I don't want to read Batman Beyond. <laughs> yeah, written by Jan Jurgens. <laughs> God damn, I love you, Dan, but God, Jesus, you do not know Batman Beyond. <laughs> yeah, stick to Superman. Yeah, you're killing it on that, Dan, just fucking killing it. 
I guess, well, where do you want to go next? Uh, I guess I will talk about, because uh, we seem to be doing DC so much love and service this week, Titans number seven. I read this. We actually put the review up at the same time. <laughs> it's funny that can happen sometimes. Yeah, I, I wasn't actually going to put, I was going to put up another one, but I'm like, nah, people like the Titans. I'll put it up as my first comic for the day. <laughs> they really liked this issue too. This one's killing it. This one for my channel is about to break 2K very soon. Everyone oh, wow. was super interested to read this one, and for good reason, because what happens in it, Matt? Superman meets Wally West. And they recognize each other, as they should, because they're from the same world. They do. I did find it weird that they didn't go into detail about that. No, they were just They just sort of, of like talk about it and like, hey, yeah, you know, the world's been edited and Superman's like, wait, what? And then they just talk about something else. <laughs> they, do share, they do share some secrets, though. About, or Superman actually confides in uh, Flash about his son, something he only did yeah. with the Trinity up until now. I'm like, oh, well, that's nice. He trusts Wally enough to tell him what's going on with him. Yeah, because of his interactions pre-Flashpoint with him and everything. So, yeah, he, he knows that this is Wally. They kind of share the feeling, too, where it's like, hey, we don't have to be alone anymore in this world because we know. Yeah, yeah, and, and I, I like that Batman and um, Superman is sort of telling uh, Wally to, like, go after Linda and everything because Linda and him aren't a thing anymore. And how he's sorry that so much changed for him where nothing really changed for Clark. Mm, yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it, and it's kind of nice, too. It's like when Superman tells you to do something, when Superman tells you to go find love, you'll do it. <laughs> yeah, you, you get super motivated. <laughs> hey there, true Americans. Did you know motivational speaking is also one of my amazing superpowers? <laughs> you should do it. Go and find love. Whatever you say, Big Blue, I'll do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's nice. They also bring back a bunch of classic Teen Titans ephemera. They bring back Titans Tower in Manhattan. They do, and yeah, following on from last issue, they go to Manhattan because that's what they thought uh, they found in Abracadabra's mind. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we know it's something completely different. I like, though, that they took that the wrong way, but it ultimately ended up being good, because it's like, hey, but yeah. they rebuild the Titan's Tower where it's supposed to be, though. Yeah, I, I like that part of the story where, like, Dick brings in um, their lawyer, Miss Sundali, and she's just got all these forms to fill out because of this, like, you need, you need to tell the city when you're going to be flying your invisible jet around, and and there's there's zoning permissions and everything, and you didn't think it would be so difficult to set up a, a base in a city. Yeah, I, I like they actually bother going through all the red tape and paperwork where it's like, no, we just yeah. can't set up another bat cave or something underground. We want this to be legit. We want to own an actual building. Yeah, yeah. you wonder why the, the Justice League have the watchtower in space. They don't have to deal with any of that. Yeah, they don't got to pay for shit. Nobody owns space. <laughs> in space, no one can tell you what to do. <laughs> Not until they pass them new space laws. <laughs> we can do whatever the fuck we want. I can imagine up on the watchtower they got gambling and hookers and cockfights and everything. Ain't no laws in space. <laughs> it's international waters. <laughs> it's national, but with aliens. <laughs> I would say the only law in space is the Green Lanterns, but Green Lantern is there partying with them too, so he looks the other way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Green Lantern is Guy, and he doesn't give no fucks. <laughs> yeah, really. He, he's the one supposed to be looking over that part of space, but he's like, nope, nope, keep the hookers and blackjack coming. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way Guy likes it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Titans, really fun. Everyone is loving it and with solid reasoning to see these two characters back together again. I, I, I wonder, too, to myself, and I'm sure you brought this up, hey, how come Flash doesn't mention the button to Superman? I'm like, oh, because uh, Barry and Batman and him agreed not to until they found, you know, more, more evidence to bring to the greater superhero community. Yeah, yeah, so I guess after the button storyline... <laughs> They'll have to make it public, and they'll have to tell everyone. And man, how's that going to change the universe when everyone knows that time has been edited? Oh, that's gonna it's gonna throw some wrenches into the works. I know that it's gonna have a huge ripple effect. People are gonna ask, you know, are we here for a reason? You know, what if what if I was different? Imagine for some of these characters that they're like, I was better. I was better in the other universe. Mm, mm -hmm. like, like imagine Arsenal being like, yeah, man, you had a daughter. Yeah, yeah, like realizing he had a daughter and all this stuff. He had a good relationship with Green Arrow and everything. And yeah, 
yeah, shit was actually better for you in the other universe. I mean, that would be devastating, right? To know there was another time not so long ago when you, you were in a better place than you were now. Yeah, it'd also make all these heroes very, very upset with Mr. Manhattan. <laughs> I'm sure it would. Be like, you know, you changed our lives, you ruined our lives in many cases, and, you know, we want to fight back against you. You know, it might even, too, it might make them mad at, like, Batman and Green Lantern and all the characters who stayed more or less the same. Hey, nothing changed for you, dick. Yeah, and it also might make them mad because they knew before them. They didn't come to them straight away and everything. And then you get characters like Nightwing who's like, whoa, but I found my way back to the way I was meant to be. Yeah. What does that say about me and my life that I found my way back? And then it also brings up the, the stuff with Dr. Manhattan where he meant for that to happen, for them to all become better. I wanted you to be stronger to fight the next threat that's coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. I, I had if to they pull this off, if they pull this off. I had to challenge you and break you up for something else. <laughs> only so you could come back together again but then again didn't they say in dc universe rebirth he broke them up because he hated their happiness or something like that i always thought that's what it was going to be you know i hate that your world is not like my world yeah well he is jealous yeah because my world is cruel and realistic and heroes die in my world yeah i could, I could see that happening as well yeah uh, another book I read this week, Mighty Thor, number 15. This is the kickoff of the Asgard-Shiar Empire War. Oh, nice. A story that could very well have been a crossover, but thank fuck it's not a crossover. It could very, it could have definitely have been like a big multi-book crossover by the sounds of it. <laughs> I'm glad it's not. Basically, Gladiator and the Shiar Elite, they show up in Asgard, they kick all the asses, and they kidnap Jane. Oh, really? I, I know the Shiar Elite are in uh, the Thanos book at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They show up, they beat everyone up. Apparently they're following these new guys called the Shi'ar Gods, who are like these two shiny people. Oh, oh shiny people. Yeah. Also, people ask me some interesting questions, because Smasher is there, and I know you were telling me you became a fan of Smasher and Cannonball and that other book where they had like a kid and shit. Uh, really? I said that? Yeah, that was like back in Avengers World or some shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. That's going back a while. That's going back um, a long while. I was surprised. You know, I always love it when our fans show they have longer memories than us. Yeah, God. Oh, God damn. Now you're making me remember Avengers World and how amazing that book was. Yeah, you were that, all that, over that book it. was amazing. <laughs> yeah, you were all over that book. So, yeah, I mean, that's really all you can say about Mighty Thor number 15. Continues to be awesome. You thought the War of Realms was epic with all the sword and sorcery, Lord of the Rings fantasy stuff. Well, guess what? Thor is a cosmic book now. Yeah, well, that's like the other, the Unworthy Thor book. That's now a cosmic book as well. Yeah, in fact, uh, Unworthy Thor, the way he looks now, he's on the cover of this, which makes me wonder, is this the book where they're finally going to meet up again? Yeah, well, he, he appears to be coming back for for uh, the Ultimate Hammer and to help Asgard and everything. So, yeah, definitely, it would, probably. It would, it would be funny to see the Asgardians losing their war against the Shi'ar, only for Unworthy Thor to come back and be a hero again and save the day. And that makes him worthy of the ultimate hammer. Yeah, and then to like have Jane kind of wonder, well, shit, you know, he's back now. He's doing the thing. Do they even need me anymore? Do I even need this anymore? Yeah. Well, that then it gets even more interesting because we find out in this issue, Jane is still dying very much because she's spending so much time as Thor. It's still continuing to purge her chemo, so she's very close to being on death's door right now, and she'll have to make a choice. Do I be Thor 24-7 and live, or do I die as Jane Foster? Yeah, that's going to be very interesting. That's going to be, man, it's going to be heavy, but I'm excited for it. So uh, that's pretty much everything I read this week, Matt. Did you add anything else? Uh, yeah, I had, uh, what did I have? I had Earth 2 Society issue 20. Nice, still digging that. Uh, I think this is the penultimate issue before the book ends. Really? Um, I, I just read the solicitations and there seems to be more solicitations. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a monthly book. It's once a month. Ah, right. Um, so yeah, um, I could. I think it's ending very soon because they they come into the the final fate of Earth Two is what this story is called. Um, they they're still running around that that rebooted Metropolis and everything. The Sandmen are attacking them. Ultra Humanite is the one who's running everything. Oh sweet. Uh, and uh, what I really liked about this issue is how paranoid the 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 heroes were. They've got this city that's in pristine condition. No one no one's touched it. This world that's perfect, and they're all like paranoid about this massive attack by the Sandman because they don't want it to happen. What happened to like the other two Earth Twos? 
they, they want it to be left alone and everything. So they're, they're careful about civilian casualties and destroying buildings and everything. And it's really great to see them do that. Yeah, it's nice when heroes care, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's really great. Make, make some heroes. Make some heroes. Make them care, yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Uh, I had Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps. Oh, yeah. How's, how, how's that doing? That's doing pretty well. There was the end of the Bottled Light uh, saga with um, Laughleys and Brainiac. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, they were fighting Brainiac. How cool was that? Yeah. There's a really cool cameo in here. So we find out what happened to the that, that new 52 Lobo. Yeah, I saw him under glass. <laughs> yeah, he, he was been shrunk down and had... And, um, Guy was going to release him, and then Hal swoops in and is like, "Nope, we better not release that one. He's bit too bit too um, much of a hand handful." <laughs> I like that they're making jokes about it now, even though that's kind of confusing because we saw slowly over time that Lobo turned into old Lobo. Oh, it's probably a clone or something. It's a clone or a joke. The fact oh. is, no one cares. Everyone's just happy old yeah. Lobo is back. No one will question this, and if they really care. Then, then they'll hear my pitch for a Lobo miniseries that explains what happened. What's the pitch? Uh, Lobo didn't really die because he can heal from practically everything. So he healed from other Lobo's attack and found him. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, you know. Here's a pitch too. I know it's kind of a Marvel thing, but have Lobo kills the DC universe for like a one shot. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. That's a fucking one shot right there. That's a goddamn Elseworld story right there, and you know it. Imagine Lobo killing the DC universe, and you do it like a straight up comedy. Yeah, that's a that's a uh, freaking book. But uh, yeah, that book was pretty good, and it ended with the Sinestro Corps and Green Lantern Corps forming one giant corps. Oh shit! Do they have a new name, or are they just the Joint Corps? Nah, they're just the Joint Corps. They should pick a new name. <laughs> the the slightly brownish core, <laughs> the dual core. Hey, what do you get when you mix uh, yellow and green together? Brown. You get the color of poop. <laughs> you are brown lanterns. You are the masters of shit. <laughs> I, I love a fan of ours actually did brown lantern uh, fan art for us back in the day. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> that was good stuff. MD Kex, wherever you are, man, that was good shit. Uh, that it for you, or you got more? Nah, that's it. Okay, so yeah, I guess that'll just about do it for us, everyone. You know, good, solid show, meat and potato show, no fucking around kind of show. Just, you know, getting in there, getting it done. We hope you enjoyed listening to it. Uh, I know I had fun bringing it to you. Uh, As always, if you are a Patreon, you will be getting the show first before anyone else as soon as it's done, which it's 11.30 now, which means I'll probably have it up by midnight. Uh, Also, too, if you want to download the show and follow it around uh, with you everywhere you go, be sure to go to the Podbean account all of which is linked down in the description uh i actually did matt i don't know if you saw this i actually did get us a soundcloud page officially and i actually put up episode 41 just just as a test i don't know what the limits are on that and i don't know how much you have to pay but yeah we officially have a soundcloud thing now and maybe for the future i'll do more with it cool I was looking at the thing that I'm like, well, can we take the episodes we have now in an RSS feed and just put that over on Podbean? You can, but you can't, and it's a whole big thing, and I'm already like two months of money in to Podbean, so maybe when my money's up, I'll have to decide what I want to do next. I know a lot of people have been asking for iTunes, and I want to try and bring the show to iTunes because it's, I guess, it's just easier for people with iPhones. Yeah, definitely. And other devices like so you know next time you ask i'm trying i'm trying to make shit work i'm i'm not an expert in this field but i'm trying my hardest to put stuff together on that Mm -hmm. also uh, i mentioned it on the kate tv podcast but i'll say it here too uh thank you jm for your donation over on patreon you officially put us over the top we are now at a hundred dollars on patreon so thank you so much to him thank you so much to everyone who gives to make the show possible for me and matt it's a big help and as we wind down i want to remind you be sure to like subscribe favor do all that other social media jazz uh matt and i both have facebook pages we both have twitters those are all linked in the description you can find those there for more news and updates on the comic multiverse uh any parting thoughts matt uh, no, not really. I'm looking forward to next week's comics. There's some pretty good stuff coming out. God, it just doesn't stop. I'm not even done this week's comics. There's a bunch <laughs> of stuff I haven't read yet. I'm feeling very overworked. I know I am as well. <laughs> I'm a goddamn workhorse over here. So until next time, everyone, we hope you had fun, and we will see you all next week. Bye-bye. See ya.